Welcome everyone and thank you for your being here today for our webinar dedicated to continuous education and applied AI in the MENA region. I'm delighted to be here with you. My name is Hen Shaheen. I'm Dota MENA Director and I will be your host today alongside my colleague Mishkat Ben Hamida, who is the Marketing Project Manager at Dotom Academy. So Let's take a look at the program. We will explore together the exciting world of AI in the MENA region. AI is transforming industries, shaping innovation and creating new opportunities across MENA nations. So let's dive into the incredible journey of AI in this dynamic and diverse region with our speakers. I have the honor to introduce our speakers. So, Professor Serge Miranda, Scientific Director of the Master of Science at STIA and the President of DOTOM Academy. Shadi Agdebis, Sales Manager at Oracle in Qatar. Engineer Uh, Nabil Al Mahmoud, Executive Director at Isola Innovation Accelerators in Bahrain. Professor Rohan Eshkin Ezul, Vice Dean, Faculty of Agriculture Science and Technologies at Yashur University in Turkey. Professor Abbas Nasser, the Dean of Faculty of Art and Science in Lebanon. Professor Uh, Dr. Uh, Ahmed Al-Zuhair, Director of Product Development at UK Company in Saudi Arabia. Professor Ali Jawa, the Dean of the School of Computing and Data Science in Qatar. Professor Izik Abey, teaching at Eastern Mediterranean University in North Cyprus and uh, Head of Arabian Deep Farm Project in Turkey. So the question session will take a place at the end. However, feel free to share your comments and questions in the chat. And please make sure to put your microphone on mute to keep description to a minimum. So I wish you all a very good event. And Professor Serge will now address the skills and job in the data and the big data, sorry, and AI for continuous education. So, Professor, I give you the floor. If you could mute yourself, please. Thank you very much, uh, Hind, and I hope everybody uh, could hear me perfectly. So it's a pleasure for me to, to speak in this webinar regarding the MENA region and uh, our effort in the area of AI education globally speaking uh, at the international level with certified degrees and profit and professional certificates leading to jobs so that's our vision and i'll try to give you in 10-15 minutes um, our vision our strategy development which is centered around what we called gradios micro masters and companions which correspond to micro bachelors and you will see the difference So let's move to, to a very short plan context of applied AI from the PR Institute. How we use a bottom um, a, a bottom up approach in order to build the degrees uh, on artificial intelligence and big data. We could identify four major jobs which correspond to skill blocks in our curriculum. And finally, for continuous education, We'll focus on two types of uh, products, e-learning products we are proposing. Gradio and digital companion. To make it simple, one is synchronous and the other is asynchronous, and you will see. So we are entering a double revolution. That will be very fast, but that's very important to keep it in mind. So it's a wonderful moment in the story of science and humanity because we are entering two revolution. The first revolution is life science. I will not talk about, but you see every week 
uh, very advanced research concerning the genome, uh, the um, uh, DNA modification, etc. Um, and the second one, second revolution is the data science. So life science and data science are leaving a strong revolution. And of course, we are interested by the latter, the data science. And here, every aspect of the economy will be impacted by data science, by AI, by big data. And therefore, that means we have a great work of education of existing engineers, existing computer scientists, and existing managers. So we have two targets, the managers and the computer scientists to educate to the integration of AI and big data. And and the second um, is um, for company transformation to integrate AI in every aspect of their activity. So we have to, to make uh, companies to adopt uh, this technology and people to adapt. So that's a double challenge we are facing today. Next. So as you see, big data and AI is a disruptive couple. And I like this image of an iceberg because you see AI is built on top of something big, which is data and big data. And as I said, uh, Jim Gray, when he got the uh, Turing Award, which is a Nobel Prize in computing, uh, he talked about this fourth paradigm of science after um, physics, after mathematics, after computing, the fourth paradigm of science we are entering is the data science. Next. So every week, and you, it's a one year anniversary of ChatGPT, and you just look at uh, the impact of this generative AI on every aspect. So I put here, uh, just as an example, the last song of the Beatles, totally rebuilt by AI music, um, from former uh, former recording, etc., and they were on top of the chart in UK. So an AI song from the Beatle, uh, from the Beatles. That's an example. But every every week we have here new impacts of generative AI. But that's just one part of uh, of um, the AI. That's one kind of tool, and there are a set of tools. Tomorrow, that's an example. Um, when I say from PC to PI, there will be an assistant, a digital assistant for everybody in this personal life, public life, or professional life. Everybody will have a personal intelligence, a personal uh, um, assistant, digital assistant. And that's an example of a new company proposing to say after the smartphone, we'll have a PIN, a PI PIN, in order to be um, our life assistant and companion. And we can use the skin as a screen. So we are today facing the teaching of um, um, science, data science, in the third A era of AI. I will not talk about the two first one. AI is born like the computers in the late 40s, uh, 60 years ago, more than 60 years ago. And um, and then they enter two winters and a spring in 2012 with deep learning corresponding to uh, here also to a Turing uh, award to three three researchers. And you, you have to think about uh, AI as a toolbox. And um, ChatGPT is just one extra uh, tool which exists in the AI toolbox. So we are entering now in the next 30 years, this era where AI will disseminate in every sector of the economy, every sector of your life, private, public or professional. So there is room for prototyping, there is room for innovation in every aspect there and demonstrate added value services. Next. So our vision is to build a complete institute of AI, applied AI. I, I like this word of applied AI because in AI there are two major fields. I would say the science part, 
the optimization part, which is more or less mathematics. And the second is applied AI or AI engineering, how you develop application which are using data, analysis of data in order to predict the future, in order to prevent something in the future, etc. And in a personalized way, here is the 3P again. So we may see here we are fully committed to building a complete institute uh, after high school, integrating a bachelor and a master leading to specialist. And of course, the difference between bachelor and master is, to, is very strong and led to different products we are looking at. We're also looking at college case in Africa uh, where um, to build digital literacy platforms using the next generation low orbit satellites like um, Star, uh, Starlink or, um, or um, OneWeb. So we are in front of that. So in front, there were an important report, say in France 2030, to identify what were the expected jobs from AI and big data. And what are the, so here you may see, and I will return to that, the three major jobs are data manager, data scientist, and big data developer. So you may take it, and, and I took um, another um, diagram in the US in order to see what are the fundamental skills in the digital economy. And you will see in terms of digital skills, what I call ABCD, data analysis, data management in terms of big data management, cloud and cyber security, and development of AI applications. So you see these four digital skills expected in the market today correspond to four blocks of courses in the bachelor and the master degree we built three years ago. Next. So three major jobs, data scientist, data engineer, software engineer. I, I, I could, it's not necessary to go into detail what are their development, but that's the highest demand uh, today of the market. And um, we build a degree around, around this target, saying any graduate student should be able to work in one of the three ability here to find a job there. Next. So we have um, here a list of skills expected within the degree, whether it's a bachelor or a master doesn't matter. So like um, that for data scientist, mathematics, mathematical fundamentals, um, linear algebra, set theory, then to build um, pipeline architectures, to use algorithm for machine learning, deep learning, data preparation and cleaning. So that's the example of what we expect from a data scientist. Same with data engineer, etc. And we have here some fundamentals languages from a computer science point of view. For data management, it's the SQL standard coming from SQL to NoSQL and NewSQL. In the data analysis uh, and AI, we have a Python. And for application development, we have two schools, Java and JavaScript, where the demand of the market is tremendous. And then, of course, and you can really need the three others. We have the cloud architecture, and here there are some major leaders around the Amazon, around the Microsoft Azure, um, Google, and Oracle. The most demanded IT job, just to give you an idea, um, you have here in terms of software developer compared to what I just said, the, we happened here, we see system administrator, so the system engineers, and we have a, what is a typical framework and typical training duration in order to create this knowledge. And just to take this example of the bachelor, uh, the BR bachelor, we built around this block of skills leading to jobs. Of course, at a lower level in the market, it could be a, a programmer assistant, a developer assistant, architect assistant, but they should be able to go into a team 
where you have full development of data management, of data analysis or data application development. So we know now, to, let's go to the continuous education and we clearly identify two types of product. What we call Gradeo, that's a European name for micro masters, which exist in the US. So block of skills um, corresponding to part of a master degree. And what we call digital companions correspond to micro bachelors, um, part of a bachelor degree. And in the BR Institute we are building, we infer from existing bachelor and, and master these two types of e-learning products. Major difference is due to the age of the student and to the level of the student. For um, digital companion, we have a young student, 18 years old, so they cannot be at that time totally autonomous. And therefore, we need to have supervised synchronous uh, e-learning face to face. So that means at the same time, small group of students. 24 is uh, in the average. And then we have, um, we could propose part of a bachelor degree given there. So what is a digital companion? It's a set of courses, we may call that the passports, corresponding to a learning path, to a track. So you now know there are at least four learning tracks for digital companions, data management track. Uh, so we have a companion uh, uh, learning path on data management, data analysis, cloud, and um, application development. So that's for, I would say, young students or for out of job students or students who miss, I would say, the university motorway. So they miss uh, the university track and they are in the market and they are looking for jobs. In some countries in Africa, that represent one third of the students uh, trying to go to university. And finally, the gradios. And gradios, here we have mature students. We have students who are around 22 years old, average, and therefore they could be part of autonomy. And for them, asynchronous learning could be beneficial beneficiary for them, not for the others. So that's a major difference with the two products, synchronous and asynchronous. We already have four gradios uh, to enter this demand on AI and big data, three with Oracle and one with Google. And we're building autonomous gradios and tomorrow working on Oracle on uh, functional gradios with the help of use case prototype by our, our master students in order to build in the area of AI what we call the series by example, using concrete example for learners in order for them to redo, uh, to redo the use case and eventually uh, extend it to another use case. So next, so the first uh, gradio we have with Oracle concerns the data management aspect, block of know-how around the SQL standards. So we have one with one course, one graduate course from the master and one course from Oracle University. So students here typically got two certificates leading to a, a job, what we call also a passport, SQL passport. The next stack web and mobile development here we have um, two academic course from the br master and we have one industrial course around java proposed by oracle 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 do not forget both sun and uh, therefore java is part of their product next third gradio with artificial intelligence and big data, we have three academic courses from the Graduate Master BR, representing what is called in terms of European certification, six ECTS, European Credit Transfer System, plus an Oracle course on machine learning on Oracle Cloud, uh, which represent, uh, which is also, which is also a certificate. So this set represent a uh, graduate. And then we have one with the Google Cloud on artificial intelligence in the cloud. 
So that's one key area where we have two courses from the master and three courses from Google Cloud. And then we are building totally autonomous and practical uh, Gradio, which means one theoretical course or and uh, one practical course. So the practical course here on SQL is with Oracle, and we have another one under development with Postgres. So students have having um, in this Gradio, for instance, three hours of theoretical course on the standard SQL, and then three hours of practical course on a leader on a leader in the open source market or free market uh, for them uh, here it's with oracle and then we have um, an advanced course on uh, big data sql again one theoretical course or a graduate course from master and then a practical course from um, concerning a product like uh, oracle or postgres and then just one word, I will just use a comment here because we are under development of this aspect. So that's for young students, out of job students or people looking for um, a digital or a digital uh, um, track in their curriculum. So trying to change um, opportunities for them. So we call them digital companion. It's a, an important word in French also, companion is the same word. Digital companion means somebody who is going to you for a great travel in the digital world could be application development, data management, or AI. Free, uh, so we have here three introductory courses from three hours to 24 hours. And then we have a skill passports courses dedicated like an SQL, the one I talk about from SQL. 30 hours represent one week, could be two, two weeks in residence, or could be three hours a week during uh, 10 weeks. And then we have uh, digital companions and bootcamp. So le let's go to next slide rapidly. So just to identify why we selected Python, Python, SQL, Java and JavaScript, you could see that's most required languages in the market. Next. Then we have we look at ChatGPT to see what are the most in demand frameworks in the job market. Next. And then that's the companions we're proposing in two track, the D data scientist companion and the digital companion for web and mobile application development. And you see the courses, the passports, um, and then uh, the, the frameworks which are used. So here again, very a companion is a practical course, so uh, which is which is a uh, tool centric. That means uh, students spend um, half of the, their time uh, studying not only a very uh, twenty percent theoretical and eighty percent practical with a project. Every student should have a tutor project and um, using a leading platform. That's the way we build courses for digital companions. Thank you for your attention and I say see you tomorrow. By the way, tomorrow in the Basque language is called BR, Big Data Intelligence for Human Augmented Reality. So thank you, um, Mishka Ten Ind, and I thank give you, you the, the the feedback. Thank you. Thank you. For the continuation. Yeah, so for so, the continuation, unfortunately, uh, Shadi El Debs uh, couldn't be here today with us. Uh, so we will jump to the engineer Nabil Al Mahmoud. Yeah, I'm going to talk about the AI investment in the GCC stage. Uh, first of all, uh, let's talk about the, the move of GCC states towards AI. Um, the AI contribution in the, in the global economy is estimated at uh, 15.7 trillion by the year 2030. Therefore, the, the GCC states have taken lots of initiatives in the, in the era of Industry 4.0. And uh, governments actually have uh, integrated AI into their national economic visions and strategic planning and uh, processes. 
Based on the ability of the of the government to apply AI techniques to public services, uh, five of the GCC economies ranked among the world's top 60 economy. And that's according to uh, Oxford Inside Government Readiness Index. Uh, as a matter of fact, by the year 2030, AI's economic contribution to the GC states is expected to exceed 277 billion US dollar. Just to have a, a, an idea about uh, يعني, some of the areas that we do focus on, on the uh, utilizing AI at the GCC states, uh, healthcare, financial services, and mainly, mainly banking sector, uh, transportation, uh, high, uh, high education and training, and uh, traffic system control. The AI contribution by 2030. So uh, let's start with the, with the Saudi Arabia, which is the biggest economy in the region. The AI's contribution to the economy by the year 2030 is anticipated to reach 135.2 billion US dollar. Whereas the AI contribution as a percentage of GDP in Saudi Arabia would reach 12.4 billion US dollar. In UAE, the AI contribution to the economy by again the year 2030 would reach 96 billion US dollar. And the its contribution as a percentage of GDP would reach 13.6 US dollar. The rest of the GC countries, uh, specifically Bahrain, Kuwait, Qatar, and Oman, uh, collectively, I mean, uh, the, the, uh, the, the AI contribution to their economy by the year 2030 would reach 45.9 billion US dollar, and uh, its contribution as a percentage of GDP would reach 8.2 billion US dollar. AI roles in, in national strategic framework of the GCC states, just to have some ideas. Uh, about you know, the, the initiatives and projects taking place in the GC states. Let's start with Bahrain. The, the key strategy vision is the digital strategy for the year uh, 22 to 26. Um, the key goal is to use digital technologies to strengthen government services, processes, and decision making and data uh, sharing capabilities. The major initiatives uh, behind the year 2017, establishing Nasser Vocational Training Center, running a, a national program for AI, the year 2020, launching the first AI Academy, and there are various initiatives, uh, i.e. hosting ICT services like Amazon Web Service uh, Center, uh, Huawei, Microsoft, and Cisco. Kuwait has a new Kuwait vision 2035 uh, adapts AI to adapt AI within government agencies to contribute to the vision. Uh, major activities, uh, the Central Agency for Information Technology Agency has teamed up with Microsoft to launch a training program for uh, senior government officials. The goals are to enhance the knowledge and confidence in AI. Oman has vision 2040 and e e Oman uh, 2030. Um, and that's to build a foundation to utilize and benefit uh, from, from digital technologies, mainly AI, to increase productivity and create jobs. Some of the major, uh, yani major activities, the Information Technology Authority 4.0 Digital Trends Forum, which stressed the importance of AI as the key fourth industrial revolution technology was formed. Qatar has the National Vision 2030 uh, to produce world-class AI applications and establish the country as an efficient consumer of AI with a properly uh, educated citizenry, sound laws, and ethical guidelines. Just uh, 
to have an idea about major activities. The year 2019 launched national AI strategy. The focus, on, uh, focus was centered on education, research, data access, employment, business, and ethics. And I'm sure uh, Professor Ali would uh, talk about Qatar deeply and Qatar uncovers more, more initiatives and projects. Uh, Saudi Arabia, of course, has vision 2030. Uh, the, the, the key goal is to transform the country into an industrial powerhouse and the global, global logistics to reduce dependence on oil, diversify to the economy, and develop public service sector. Few initiatives. The year 2017 established an intellectual property office. 2018 granted Saudi citizenship to an AI humanoid robot, Sophia. Uh, the year 2019, they established STAIA, and STAIA is one of the most significant authority actually in Saudi Arabia, caters for AI and big data as well. And there are other plans to open an AI college. Uh, last but not least, the UAE uh, uh, has vision 2021, AI strategy 2031, and that's to contribute to the objectives of UAE Centennial 2071, boost government performance and create uh, a new market with high economic value. Uh, major activities 2015, uh, to 2018, Dubai attracted uh, 21.6 billion US dollar in FDIs for AI and robotics. 2017, establishing Dubai Future Foundation and appointing the first AI minister. Uh, the year 2019, Abu Dhabi established the world's first research based AI university, specializes in computer vision, ML, and NLP, and AI. Uh, actually used in traffic system control as network of cameras and that's all thank you so much for your attention thank, thank you. you thank you so now we will uh, move on to the topic the professor rohan so i give you the floor if you could please mute yourself hi everyone uh I'm from Yashar University, uh, giving lectures at the Department of Agricultural Sciences and Technology, at the same time, Food Processing Department at Yashar University. Uh, today, I want to give some introductory information to all of you about the use of artificial intelligence subject in food and agriculture. So, AI is transforming uh, farming and food production, boosting efficiency and sustainability throughout the supply chain. So technologies like uh, machine learning, drones and sensors, process data on weather, soil market trends, empowering farmers to make smarter choices. So this results in better resource management, eco-friendly farming methods, increased yields, less waste and efficient logistics. So ultimately, it creates a stronger, more productive food system that will tackle the needs of a growing global population. So in this slide, we see some uh, facts about the importance of agriculture and food production. As you may see in the slide, agriculture uh, is a corner store stone of human sustenance, uh, providing not only food, but also economic stability, health and cultural heritage. So it's the vital bridge between nature's resources and our sustenance. So they, it powers economies uh, in global scale. Beyond just food, it shapes communities, tra traditions, and also the global trade. Its role in ensuring food security, promoting health, driving economic growth, and preserving cultural identities is essential for our existence and societal well-being. So let's have a look at artificial intelligence in farming. So 
Artificial Intelligence e, revolutionizes the farming e, by enabling data driving e, decisions, autonomous operations, precision management. So as you may see from the heading subtitles here, with the machine learning, predictive analytics and robotics, farming becomes more efficient and precise. So AI processes weather, soil and crop data for actionable insights, allowing targeted interventions like the precise irrigation and early pest detection. So autonomous vehicles and AI equipped robots handle tasks, uh, so cutting labor needs and boosting productivity. So this technology promotes sustainability and also increases yields and secures food by balancing the agricultural changes. So let's have a look at the crop monitoring. So uh, in the next slide, we see in the crop monitoring, how can we take the benefits of AI in crop monitoring? So we may take the advantages in various technological facts. So to summarize, we can say that the AI combines the satellite imaginary, drones and also ground sensors to monitor the crops using machine learning to analyze these data. It identifies patterns in crop health, growth uh, stages and also pests and nutrient issues much more accurately. So farmers get real-time insights making proactive decisions possible by that way. So this enables precise actions like targeted use of fertilizers and also pesticides in a specific field areas by optimizing some kind of resources, improving yields and also reducing the environmental impact. So I think we can have a look at the pest and disease management in the next slide. So AI also can help uh, us to manage the pest and disease subject. So uh, it aids pest and disease management by uh, using historical records, environmental data, and also the real-time monitoring. So machine learning spots patterns and anomalies linked to the pest outbreaks or crop diseases. So by that way, it detects some changes in plant health, also predicting traits earlier. So this situation enables much more precise actions like applying targeted pesticides or preventative measures by reducing the spread's impact. Overall, AI empowers the proactive pest control, cutting crop lo losses, and also we can take the advantage for promoting sustainable far farming uh, with fever growth treatments. So sustainable agriculture and uh, supply chain op uh, optimization helps us uh, for most uh, sides, for most subjects, because sustainable agriculture prioritizes the environmentally friendly practices, preserving resources and also supporting the local communities through the methods like crop rotation and integrated pest management. So supply chain optimization in agriculture leverages AI, IoT and data analytics to streamline the production and distribution, reducing waste and inefficiencies. This benefits consumers with fresher, safer food and improves profitability and sustainable sustainability uh, for producers across the supply chain. So we may say about the future prospects as AI in food and agriculture promises precision farming and also predictive analytics and sustainable methods. It helps farmers allocate resources better, make data driving choices and manage risks linked to climate change and also crop issues. So advanced algorithms will transform the crop breeding for stronger, higher yield varieties. So we may think like the AI 
driving supply chain improvements, boost efficiency, cut waste, and also ensure food safety, engaging customers, and enhancing the transparency. So to say overall, AI integration in food and agriculture builds much more resilient, sustainable, and productive systems to make the global food demands and also environmental challenges. Here we uh, are about to start a deep farm project. Yeah, so this is a kind of uh, project uh, with the fund of Erasmus Plus, capacity building in higher education program. In this program, we uh, in higher education uh, for the Europe side and also for the third country side, we reinforce the knowledge and capacity of students in agricultural degrees with the use of new tools like AI and IoT and the application of big data uh, for the learning by doing approach. So we want to support the deals, uh, the Green Deal goals. Uh, by making this, uh, we want to transform, we want to apply the digitalization of agriculture tools to the fields. So in this project, we aim to improve the level of competences in the student side. And also we want to enhance, as I say, the dig digitalization and international works and collaborations are important within scope of this project. So we want to stimulate the cooperation of institutions. We want to make the capacity building with exchange of good practices and information. So as we go to the next slide, in Deep Farm project, uh, we first of all will model the tested, uh, we will model the some kinds of modules, and also we will first test this module in in Turkey, in uh, case of olive. So Yashar University will recruit students for the pilot plan. Uh, and also in this uh, plan, uh, we will try to teach students the digitalization parts of the uh, project. So the pilot will be replicated in the other third countries involved. So we will run the modules in different food products. So in Turkey, it's case of olive, and for the other countries, it will be the other representative materials. So a graduate level course will be designed within scope of this project. Again, it's about the digitalization of the agriculture, and this course will cover agricultural topics. So mostly concerning the targeted product to olive, and olive oil production, the waste management, the yield, conservation. And these concepts learned in the first part of this course will be applied, as I said, to the other, other agricultural products in the third countries. So in this figure, we see the yards, the olive oil yards in Turkey. Uh, so we will be collaborating with the Turkey Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry Only Research Institute. So they have a large area. The first part of their institution is in Izmir in Turkey, and the remaining application field is around 50 acres of land for fully olive oil trees. So we will apply our techniques and practices together with the technicians and students within scope of this deep farm project. So finally, uh, I want to say uh, that to conclude uh, to my slides, AI is a quite in shaping the future of food and agriculture. So it brings some transformative changes to every industry. So it's ability to analyze data, optimize resources and innovative leads to efficient and sustainable trends. So from precision farming, to supply chain efficiency, AI promises enhanced production, reduced environmental impact, and also food security. So it's reshaping the global food production, distribution, and consumption methods. So it's an important subject. We are very happy to be a part of this valuable project. 
e, to serve many kinds of uh, technic, technical knowledge to other uh, members of our consortium. Again, many thanks for giving me the floor within the scope of today's seminar. Uh, best regards. So we will have the honor of listening to Professor Izik. <coughs> Professor. Okay. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everyone. Um, well, I'll be talking about two issues mainly. One of them will be our contribution on the Deep Farm project on digital agriculture. And the other one will be related with um, the scholarships we will have for one student from Yashar University and one student from EMU. And also the dual diploma program we have between ST and EMU. From the attendees list, I see some of my students are uh, already uh, watching this webinar. So let me start with that before we go on to the first slide. Um, yeah, this, this slide can stay on the screen for a while. Uh, we have an MS dual diploma program between STI and EMU, which is already active. And there are students who graduated with uh, both EMU and STI master's diplomas. Um, very basically what the program is, is the students start at EMU, their master's studies, take their at least first five courses at EMU, then they join the program and they can go to STIA or they can also join in online mode, take courses from STIA, and uh, in the meantime they try to complete the EMU course requirements. Uh, if they do that, they take the EMU diploma then they complete the STA requirements and they get STA diploma. Uh, of course, there's a course equivalence table for, co for master's courses which are offered by EMU and STA. So based on that table, a course taken at STA will also be counted towards uh, the student's EMU degree. Uh, so that's uh, very briefly what that program is. I've given information to my students about the prospect of getting scholarships to take courses uh, at STI and also at University of Siena in Italy. So I will not go into details of that. So let's proceed with the first slide now. OK, so we have uh, formed a partnership uh, with Yashar University. Um, Ruhan uh, Uzel Hoca, uh, Professor Uzel has already given information about what will happen on the uh, Izmir or Yashar University site. Uh, here uh, we are uh, represented as the administration company of Famagusta Technopark and the uh, basic contribution of our part will be on image processing, um, neural network, uh, weather data processing and uh, also big data. Next slide please. Okay, um, well we will be mostly concentrating on AI supported diagnosis of olive tree diseases. So we need some photos or images from olive trees and uh, we can compare these images with uh, the images in our database showing healthy and uh, olive tree leaves with diseases. So we will decide whether there's a prospect of a disease. Uh, if there's such a case, we need to do some treatment. There's already an MS project which has been completed on this uh, by my student Aras Uluda, who will also be working for this project. Um, now, when we come to the importance of olive, it is one of the most important fruits with a total production quantity of more than 23,600,000 tons in 2020. And uh, Let's just compare the area devoted to olive production to another wide used fruit. Uh, for instance, apples. Olives occupy almost three times more total space than apple trees in the world. So it's a very important uh, fruit. Now, in the um, deep farm project uh, part of our work, we will be, I said, we'll be concentrating on diseases. Here there is an example for a disease called olive peacock spot disease. It's a fungal disease uh, which appears on olive trees um, as circular spots, as you see in the uh, picture uh, below the slide or down part of the slide. It will affect the trees throughout the growing season and may cause 
really big losses in yield. Um, it causes blemishes on the fruit, delays ripening, and reduces the yield of oil. Next one, please. Um, of course, we have to have a healthy leaves class because we will get images and compare them with uh, the images in the database. Um, a user interface is needed for olive farmers so that they can submit their uh, data, uh, for instance, by taking uh, photos from their mobile phones and uh, sent to um, the, the center which deals with uh, finding whether those images contain some leaves with disease or not. The users probably will be less technologically capable, so designing a simple user interface is also a very important part of the project. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so here I say there are no pre-made models, so we have to develop some models. Um, but basically for the comparison of um, leaves data submitted with our database, we will have a neural network based AI tool. Uh, and of course, we need to train this before putting it into action. And we say big data because we need um, as many uh, healthy or uh, olive leaves with disease pictures, photos as possible so that our decision will be better. Um, of course, later this study will be further extended to covering other uh, diseases of ad, uh, other uh, olive tree diseases like the knot disease. And uh, the idea is to recommend the possible treatments as early as possible. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, that's basically what I will have to talk about uh, the, the project on our side. But uh, according to our initial discussions with the Ashar University, there's also we need some weather data processing. Um, and olive tree needs uh, something like 800 millimeters of rain per year. And uh, in North Cyprus, we had lots of uh, seasons uh, without much rain. Uh, for instance, in 2019, we received 600 millimeters and there was a yield of 15,000 tons. But in 2022, we received only 400 millimeters, about half of what is expected per year. And the yield went down to 9,000 tons. So uh, watering trees is a must if things are not going right. And for that, uh, you need to um, process satellite images, uh, look at weather data from previous years, and make decisions. Again, this requires some artificial intelligence support. OK, so these are all I would like to uh, talk about. And uh, I want to thank everyone, all the presenters, other presenters, and the attendees, the students have joined our webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. So now we can listen to Dr. Ahmed Azuhair in Arabia Saudi. Uh, so I'm Ahmed Azuhair. I'm the director of uh, product development at Waqib. My role involves uh, leading product strategy at Fijian and steering development efforts. Uh, I see the entire product uh, life cycle. Before joining Waqib, I was an assistant a professor at King Saud University. I did my PhD at the University of uh, California, Los Angeles, where I worked on implantable neuromodulation devices. Uh, before we start, first I would like to quote His Royal Highness Prince Mohammed bin Salman on Saudi AI strategy, is that we must be uh, amongst the top five worldwide in AI. This strategy is only a small part of a transformative uh, Saudi vision. For the outlook of ongoing uh, activities in Saudi, we have a very rich schedule of actually incoming events and activities at the national stage, such as the Asian uh, Cup in 2027, the Asian Winter Olympics in 2029, and the recently announced Expo in 2030. We have also the Asian Games in 2034, and then the finally the World Cup in 2034. Besides uh, these events, we have actually several giga projects of visionary cities that are being built currently, such as uh, the Amala city at the Red Coast. Uh, we have the Gedea near uh, Riyadh. We have also the futuristic uh, city of New York. 
these events and mega cities uh, actually create tremendous opportunities in the short term for the II and the supply chain management, uh, the ground management, also transportation management, and the city management. What we want, uh, for example, as, as Warkib and the local companies, is that we want all of that to be managed and improved by AI technologies. Before going further and de de describing the, our platforms or AI applications here at Warkib, uh, I would like to take a, a step just to describe our approach. Uh, at Warkib here, we have a very unique approach to AI development locally. What do I mean is that we are one of the few companies in Saudi who undertake AI projects. We work at the full spectrum of AI development efforts across the technology readiness levels from TRL3 to TRL9, all the way uh, through commercialization. We have a full suite of AI platforms that we're going to describe shortly, but first let us talk about this figure. So we have at the left the cumulative months to reach uh, each TR level. At the right, we have the different technology readiness level. So we are mainly concerned about the development. So we take, uh, uh, for example, existing uh, uh, concepts uh, that are already uh, at the TR3, and then we take them all the way through the development uh, process cycle. So if we take, for example, one of our projects, which is the DBI. So this is a st state-of-the-art computer vision model to detect or inspect in, in, in factories. This was completely developed all the way and then integrated. And then we have seen that in the uh, many local Saudi factories, which improved the automation, the yield, and then the processing overall. The next slide uh, shows the different platforms that we, we use to deliver uh, our solutions. Our platforms include uh, web uh, for platforms, autonomous systems. We also offer cloud services to deliver uh, AI capabilities to our customers. Some of these uh, services are software uh, as, a, as a service where we actually allow our partners to use our existing uh, computational infrastructure. Uh, again, part of our autonomous sector is our UAV solutions, where we realized actually early on that we could deliver outstanding services if we deliver the entire solution. So what we offer here at Wacket is not only the AI model, but also the, uh, the UAV hardware. We uh, have found that uh, that enabled us to deliver an outstanding performance and value to our customers. So we are not just uh, designing the models, we are taking the models to practice, we're getting uh, actual real uh, performance, we are improving our models, and then this allowed us uh, to overall uh, satisfy the needs of our uh, customers. Beyond, uh, so we have just described a couple of the applications, we'll see the, some of the success stories at, at the very end, but before going there, I would like to uh, describe uh, our accelerator, Sarah. So beyond delivering AI, what we hope here at Wakib is that we foster an AI ecosystem. Uh, as you all know, that AI is uh, a very uh, an interesting uh, field. Uh, many people with many ideas, many entrepreneurs would like to pursue uh, their ideas. So what we actually uh, this recently uh, launched is uh, Sarah. So uh, Sarah is a, walk, a word in Arabic, which means uh, to to accelerate or to move forward. Uh, we help entrepreneurs uh, capitalize on their ideas, take them to the market, and then we believe that will support the entire ecosystem. In, in Over here, so you see the computer vision models are running like on the, uh, on the, uh, on the video stream. Also, the important aspect that we'll go over again is that this is integrated uh, with the uh, within full ABI solution to monitor and see the activity from different uh, plants. So you see over here, we are linking this through our ABI, our, our, our web interface, where can, they can access actually the multiple uh, locations, see analytics about the performance of these locations. Uh, the, third, the second part that I would like to go over is with the water distillation uh, company. So in Saudi, we have uh, water distillation plants at the east and in the, uh, the west coast. They transfer the uh, distilled water uh, through all uh, the cities uh, or to all cities in Saudi Arabia. 
monitoring and making sure that the safety and then, the, for example, quality and then also uh, no harmful activities or required uh, activities are performed in these vibes is actually quite a challenging process. So we worked with them to over uh, a UAV and uh, computer vision solution. So you see over here, let me go to the important part here. So this is again part of our drones uh, solution. So you see integrated web application with the video stream being taken from the drones to help them actually monitor the uh, locations uh, around uh, around these pipes. The second or the final success story is with the city of uh, uh, Neom. So uh, Neom is a futuristic new city on the uh, northwest of Saudi Arabia. As you might already know, Neom is a fast construction site with uh, tens of thousands of, uh, of workers. Monitoring the activity and safety of all of its workers is actually quite uh, challenging. So at WACIB, we offered uh, or we delivered a solution uh, where we actually uh, using our uh, quadrupters or uh, drones, integrated computer vision, and then we make sure that uh, all the workers are in compliance with the safety uh, requirement of uh, the New York City. So you see over here, this is an integrated Fijian model, and then the stream is uh, live from uh, WACIB, uh, WACIB drones. On the right, we are offering the uh, uh, the project managers a very uh, user-friendly interface to show the analytics, for example, compliance with safety metrics in all of the new uh, uh, city regions. Uh, we also uh, working now in a solution where we could actually provide uh, uh, metrics to assess the construction in place. So take images, make sure that uh, these images are being uh, checked. For example, our AI models to ensure that also construction uh, work is is being monitored with uh, with AI te technology. So this this was a uh, yeah, a short uh, introduction about uh, our AI applications at uh, at Wakib. Uh, if you have any questions or would like to talk uh, more about any part uh, that interests you later on, please, uh, uh, please let me know. Thank you all for listening and thanks again for, for the invitation to, to this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. So yeah. now we have the honor to listen to Professor Ali Jawa. It's all yours now. You can mute yourself, Professor. Hello, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you for, first for your invitation, uh, uh, all the team. Uh, at the top, uh, Professor Serge Miranda. Uh, so uh, I am currently uh, Professor and Dean of the School of Computing and Data Science. Uh, and my main research uh, is about uh, uh, formal concept analysis, uh, data analytics, uh, data science, and AI, uh, but also related to uh, to software software uh, anomaly detections and uh, and data anomaly detections, linked to the body technology about uh, blockchain and the Internet of Things and uh, uh, and cybersecurity. So I, I will talk briefly about. Uh, what what I know about continuing education in applied artificial intelligence in Qatar. So uh, in general, uh, continuing education in applied artificial intelligence in Qatar uh, uh, is uh, growing, and uh, there are too much investment, on, especially on AI technology uh, and education, either in corporation or in the universities. Uh, so. Uh, we have uh, several application uh, actually running uh, for, uh, for, for which goal is to 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 go to a knowledge based economy uh, using a, a applied uh, AI uh, as well as data analytics. Uh, at Orix, the institute where I am here, no, it is a it is a college uh, with a partnership uh, with uh, Liverpool John Moves University. So we are delivering the programs uh, on, uh, for the uh, given by uh, Liverpool John Moves University, and uh, and a degree are also given by the 
by the LGMU. Uh, and actually, we are uh, different uh, different modules on uh, for the Bachelor of Computer Science in uh, in advanced even advanced applied AI. Uh, and we are projecting uh, new new master degrees on uh, uh, AI uh, and machine learning. Uh, so uh, we have different universities in Qatar, other than our college. Of course, you have Qatar University, or, uh, and uh, which is in collaboration with, with uh, GMU. Then we have HBQU, uh, Texas University, uh, CCQ. Uh, and most of this university are including modules uh, on AI with uh, applications. So uh, I will, uh, we, we, in, in our college, we are running uh, different seminars uh, uh, of the School of Computing and Data Science. Uh, and uh, I will present mm -hmm. one of the first uh, seminar uh, reflecting the kind of research you are doing uh, here uh, currently. Uh, at our institute. So, uh, in one uh, first seminar during this first semester, uh, my colleague Hafiz Rahman, uh, he presented uh, a talk about uh, uh, how to use artificial intelligence for personalized medicines. Mm -hmm. uh, more exactly, uh, he is using bioinformatics field uh, and the, the target is to uh, enable a doctor to analyze patients, uh, patients' genetic profile and prescribe the best available drug therapy, therapy and dosage that is specific to that patient on the base of, uh, of his or her genetic profile. So this, of course, this is a very re relevant research. Uh, with uh, different uh, application and uh, supported by a publication from uh, from Hafiz Rahman that you can find uh, as well in the BLP. Uh, the the next uh, the next uh, seminar I've done it myself, so I I am just using recursion <laughs> when I'm presenting. I'm presenting one of seminar uh, that I uh, that I delivered mm -hmm. during this term. It is about uh, conceptual data reduction and application. Uh, and application. Uh, and this uh, method, uh, the conceptual method, they are, they are based on a, con a new conceptual algorithm for artificial intelligence and machine learning mainly. Uh, and uh, it is uh, formal, uh, and we assume that the world may be represented by by a domain and a range and properties, what you call properties, and uh, domain are objects that you want to analyze. Uh, and uh, we have a binary relation linking some object to some properties which are in what you call a formal context of the uh, of the domain. And from from it, we can do many things. You can extract knowledge uh, which are useful for make decision later uh, by using the 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 concept of Galois connection. And Galois connection is what I presented here in the screen. Uh, so if you have uh, we have two operators. Uh, relating uh, object to attribute. So on the left, you can find the object, uh, and on the right, you can find attributes. Uh, and uh, there are two function, dual function, F and J. Uh, function F will present all attributes which are shared by all this object in green. And this is uh, like light green. Uh, and uh, function J will, uh, at opposite side, will, uh, for some attribute, it will find all objects which are respecting, which are uh, satisfying some properties. So if you use the closure of F and J, you, you find out additional information, which means that if you have, for example, some properties B, you find corresponding object mm -hmm. uh, in green. Then you, if you apply again the operator function F, it will give you more properties generally than the properties in blue. And this property in light blue will be minus uh, properties B will be what you call additional knowledge, additional additional uh, facts which are uh, which are satisfied by uh, some uh, which are implied by some set of properties B, starting from B. Whatever is in B in blue, uh, you find that we have uh, more properties which are satisfying by any object satisfying B will satisfy more than B. Uh, in the worst scenario, they will satisfy B. So this uh, 
this is important because uh, uh, it has many application for uh, uh, for data reduction. You, you can use uh, this rule to reduce uh, data in order to, without losing dependency between uh, attribute of that data, uh, you, you, you can uh, represent, find a sample which has a meaning because it will preserve dependencies between the attribute of the of data. Uh, the, 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 this is not necessarily function dependencies, but the dependencies which are implication in the meaning of formal concept analysis. But both methods are used, either uh, preserving function dependencies or preserving uh, implications. Uh, so the third seminar was uh, given by, uh, by Professor Mahjoub from Qatar University. Uh, and he talked about the, the new impact of AI on society and education, mainly. Uh, so we we need to, uh, we are actually facing uh, what you call uncertainties uh, when it comes to managing the academia. Uh, and this is because we don't know where to go, how to teach and, uh, uh, and how to assess student because of the of the emerging of a chat gpt and all the all the stuff uh, so methods should be should uh, evolve and should continue to discuss about how to deliver a uh, new uh, in new way uh, education uh, by keeping room to the modern tools that will be used uh, as well mm -hmm. so i don't know if i i might if it's my my last slides uh, i didn't expect too much time for that uh, so, or, or before the last, uh, so uh, you have uh, also uh, uh, encouraged in our institution executive training and short courses in applied AI uh, at OEC, uh, and uh, one of them is about medical image tumor visualization and classification by uh, Dr. Hafiz, and uh, for my side about uh, how to use formal concept analysis for many many application uh, as for natural language processing, text summarization, anomaly detection, uh, uh, and so on. For the last thing that I will I will say is about uh, uh, is about uh, uh, selection of some AI project in in Qatar. So we have we have uh, this this project. Uh, I will just. Uh, talk quickly about them to finalize before ending. We have early detection of fake news over Arabic social media uh, in Qatar University at Qatar, and efficient and scalable evaluation for searching massive Arab, Arabic social media and web application, uh, web collection, sorry. Uh, intelligent system to digital support uh, paleographic analysis of ancient uh, Manuscript in Qatar, evolutionary algorithm and randomized based machine learning algorithms in my my domain, and a non-invasive monitor to predict uh, hypoglycemia in diabetes patient uh, using artificial intelligence. One important application. We have also some accepted alpha care procedures uh, in precision computation, uh, which is one of the proposal. Uh, of our group about an intelligent reminder system for Alzheimer's uh, disease. Uh, and this, this is a really uh, very uh, interesting application uh, that, uh, that that will will involve uh, di different things. We have genetic subtype of uh, glipostoma reprediction using MRI scans by uh, Rahman. Uh, and at CBU, we have a, a project about uh, how to optimize Qatar farming. And I've heard about farming during this uh, this webinar. So here it is also something that that we we uh, by using robots and artificial intelligence uh, to autonomously and periodically gather visual data that uh, about crops to assess their development, quality, and ex expected uh, yield. Uh, so you also use AI to automate uh, the cleaning and monitoring of so solar solar panels in Qatar. At QCRI, which is a, a, a eminent institution in Qatar, also uh, we also uh, use uh, artificial intelligence to for social analytics, which is a, a very important and emerging do domain. And thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. So, 
So now we will move on to the question session. Okay. Uh, there, there is one question from my student, Margaret. Can I answer that? Yes, 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 of course. Yes, yeah, of course. She, she, she typed at the chat part mm -hmm. of it. And she says, will the AI models in the European deep farming project be customized for different olive tree varieties? First of all, thank you, Margaret. That's a very good question. Um, this can be done, especially for watering, for instance. There are basically two types of olive trees in North Cyprus. One is those which are coming from Turkey, mostly called from Gemlik area. And by the way, there was an earthquake of uh, size Richter scale 5.1 today. I hope it has not affected people that much. So between this one and those which are local to Cyprus, uh, there are different watering requirements. But for disease detection, I don't think there will be any need. However, sizes of leaves may change. Uh, so at least the leaf size may be taken into attention when we're forming the database of healthy uh, leaves and uh, leaves with disease. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. If there are any other questions, do not hesitate. Uh, maybe, Professor Miranda, you can explain to the students what is the opportunity to, as a student, to join uh, this kind of project. Well, I'm talking to the students. So, first of all, there is an opportunity because within this uh, Deep Farm European project, um, we built uh, mo student mobility from uh, different regions of the world. So we're talking about the MENA region. So a couple of students will come over one month in France and one month in um, in Italy at the University of Siena in France at Estia in order to be faced with um, four graduate courses, which are the basis of um, the kernel of the BR master degree in France and the master in AI in Italy at University of Siena. And therefore the students, when they come back and do their internship in the MENA region for the olive trees, uh, they should be perfectly um, uh, uh, available in order to, to build digital forms as expected. And since there were this question, it's interesting, I didn't know before, there were so different types of olive trees. And of course, this should be integrated in their internship. So the students, um, after their internship, they should deliver a tuto, how to build a digital form uh, for olive trees, mm -hmm. using uh, sensors, using drones, how they can monitor the crop as perfectly uh, Um, and then the idea is not only to have one digital farm on olive tree somewhere in Turkey, is to build some kind of, um, for the complete sector of olive, olive crops all over the Mediterranean, they should be the beginning of building some uh, applications uh, concerning olive tree monitoring. And that's something because that's of prime importance because as we know, olive is all over the Mediterranean. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank I, you. I think that's all. The replay of the webinar and presentation document will be available from Friday on our website and social networks. So thank you everyone. And I, will, I would like, sorry, to extend a special thanks to our speakers who took the time to prepare and present such an interesting session for us. If you have uh, any further question or need additional assistance, feel free to reach out to us throughout our website.
or you can, of course, email me directly. I will be glad to help you. So I have a great week and I hope to see you at another event. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Talk with you soon. Bye bye. Okay, thanks bye -bye. a lot. Bye bye. Bye, bye everyone. Au revoir. Au revoir. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.